Hello, and welcome to today's trainer education webinar from Compliance to Commitment, the three keys to effective performance coaching, hosted by HRDQ and presented by Ken Phillips. Today's webinar will last approximately an hour. Before we begin, note there is a question, maybe it's labeled as a chat box, located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can use this during the webinar to submit any questions that you have. And then we'll either answer those questions as we receive them during the Q&A session at the end with Ken or by email after the session. My name is Sarah Montgomery and I will moderate today's webinar. I am in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Today's presenter is Ken Phillips. With more than 30 years of experience in the field of workplace learning and performance, Ken is an expert in the performance management, learning evaluation, and sales performance arenas. He is a frequent university presenter and speaker at ASTD and SHRM conferences. He has authored many learning instruments, including the best-selling Coaching Skills Inventory. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today, Ken. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, um, everyone, depending on what um, time zone you're in while participating in the webinar today. And what I'd like to do to get us started is take just a minute um, to run through the agenda for what we're going to cover in the time we're together. And um, as you can see on the slide here, what I'd like to begin with is just a brief discussion around uh, what is performance coaching. And the term coaching has come to have many, meeting, uh, many meanings um, over, the, uh, over the years. And so I want to just uh, spend some time setting the context for um, how we're referring to or how I'm referring to performance um, coaching. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll address that issue. Uh, and then the second thing on our agenda is I'm going to share with you a, a, a seven-step uh, performance coaching uh, meeting model. And uh, this is a, a model that can serve as, uh, or the model that serves as a roadmap for how to conduct an effective uh, coaching meeting discussion and consists of seven um, logical, uh, repeatable, uh, independent steps, uh, interdependent steps, I should say. And and then from that uh, seven-step coaching meeting model, we're going to extract three critical steps from the seven uh, that are critically important uh, in order it, that if, to, to execute properly in order to end up with employees who are committed to changing their behavior or performance and not merely compliant, where they're not just paying lip service um, or they're just going through the motions, but they really truly are uh, committed to changing their behavior or performance. And you'll see the three steps that we're going to focus on there on the slide on getting agreement, exploring alternatives, and getting a commitment to act. Uh, for some of you, if you were on the earlier webinar that I did back in June, uh, we focused an entire webinar on getting agreement. And so that has been recorded. And so obviously, because we're going to cover three steps in our webinar today, uh, we're not going to spend as much time on getting agreement. But if you want more information about that particular step, you can go back and um, access that uh, earlier webinar uh, where we spent the entire time on getting agreement. And then lastly, as you will see here, as Sarah alluded to, uh, we're going to save some time at the end to do uh, question and answers and hopefully answer as many questions as we can um, in, at the end of the uh, time we're together. So that's, that's essentially how we're going to spend our time today. So let's get started and we'll talk about what is performance coaching. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that, as I mentioned earlier, coaching has had, you know, has come to mean many different things to many different people. For some people, coaching is an occupation. Uh, and either you yourself or you may know people who are like executive coaches or career coaches or life coaches. Um, and so that's certainly one way that the term coaching gets used as, a, as an occupation. Uh, coaching also, the term coaching also gets used as a, a management style and particularly with the, uh, you know, with the popularity of the, uh, the Blanchard situational leadership model and coaching is one of the four leadership styles that uh, comprise the situational leadership model. So it's also become known as a 
uh, as a style of management. But the way we're looking at performance coaching is different from both of those. Not that those are wrong, it's just that we have a different focus here and I want to be sure that everybody uh, understands the, the context of how we're using the term performance coaching. And it really is an interpersonal process uh, between a manager and an employee or a supervisor and an employee and that process focuses in on improving uh, on-the-job employee behavior uh, or performance. So it's an interpersonal process and it goes on between a manager and a supervisor uh, or a manager or a supervisor and an employee and focuses on improving uh, on-the-job performance or behavior. So that's how we're talking about uh, performance coaching. Another way to to look at performance coaching and another way to put it in context is, is that it's one of the four key activities that comprises the performance management process. So the, on your screen you will see the, uh, a model of the performance management process So uh, with the four key activities. So performance management begins uh, down at the, um, in the, in the bottom middle of the slide where it says clarifying expectations. So as the performance year begins, what we want to do is get some upfront clarity around what's expected um, you know, with, uh, with and for each one of our employees. And then during, uh, course of the, during the course of the year, um, the next activity would be providing uh, and giving and receiving feedback. Um, and then the third activity that makes up the performance management process is when needed, uh, we would engage employees in coaching discussions. And then the last um, activity in the model uh, would be the end of the year appraisal process. So the key thing from this slide is that the kind of coaching we're talking about is an element that makes up the performance management process. So it's performance coaching um, and not, you know, not, it's not a term, uh, it's not an occupation, it's not a style um, of management or leadership. One other thing about performance coaching, um, and this is implied by the model, but it should take place uh, only uh, after an employee, number one, clearly understands what's expected. Um, so prior to engaging in a coaching discussion with an employee, one of the questions you should ask yourself is, you know, have you ever had a discussion with the employee around what the expectations are in this particular area? And if you can't answer that question in the affirmative, um, then what you should do is instead of holding a coaching discussion, you're probably better served to engage the employee in a discussion around expectations. Uh, similarly, with the second bullet point here, has the employee ever received feedback um, previously um, about his or her behavior or performance? So prior to getting into a coaching discussion, you want to ask yourself that second question, you know, have, have I ever given the employee feedback at least once about this particular behavior or performance? And then again, if you can't answer the question in the affirmative, then probably coaching isn't what you should be doing, but you ought to go back and have um, and, and give the employee some feedback about his or her performance or behavior. And the reason for emphasizing these two uh, particular points is that it follows that performance management model that we just looked at previously, so that we need to start with clarifying expectations, and if we haven't done that, we should do it before doing engaging an employee in a coaching discussion. And number two, if we haven't given an employee feedback at least once, we ought to do that before engaging the employee in a coaching discussion. So that will give you some context for the kind of coaching we're talking about here when we refer to performance coaching. Uh, the second item on our agenda was to introduce the um, seven-step performance uh, coaching meeting process. And as I said, what I've done is I've taken that performance coaching meeting and I've broken it down into a, a, this uh, series of seven a logical, um, interdependent, uh, repeatable steps. And so this model really provides a roadmap for how to conduct uh, an effective coaching discussion. And while all these steps um, in the coaching process are important uh, for today's webinar, uh, what we're going to focus in on are just these three critical steps in terms of getting agreement, exploring alternatives, and getting a commitment to act. Um, and these are the most critical steps uh, that I've selected uh, because, number one, 
they're the, the steps that, that managers most often get wrong and that the most, where the managers most often uh, fail to execute these steps effectively. Um, and second uh, the reason for focusing on these three steps is they are also the most critical steps in terms of ending up at the end of a performance coaching discussion where we have an employee who is 100% committed to improving his or her behavior or performance versus you know, just paying it lip service or just going through the motions and kind of going along with it because you're the boss. Um, and so we're going to focus the rest of our time on these three particular um, steps. So just to reemphasize, today's focus is how to ensure uh, performance coaching discussions result in employees who are 100% committed to improving or changing their behavior or performance and aren't just merely compliant where they're just paying lip service uh, to our discussion uh, or just going through the motions. And one other thing before we launch into the first step of getting agreement is I just wanted to um, emphasize that uh, skipping uh, or not effectively executing any one of these steps is certain to doom a manager's coaching efforts. So all three of them are that important. Um, and the last point uh, that I want to make here, which is um, talking about their relationship is multiple, multiplicative, um, not additive, is that if you don't do one of these well, um, that it, because they're not additive, that does, that means that, uh, that you know you you you, uh, you can't just kind of add these things together. But if you don't do one of them well, what will happen is it'll doom your entire coaching effort. So the the relationship is multiplicative. So it's like one times you know zero times one is still zero. So even if you get two out of the three right, and you don't get the third one right. Uh, you still end up with a zero. So the point is that that's what, how interdependent these steps are and critical these steps are. So we're going to start with getting agreement. And uh, what I want to do is to uh, launch a poll around the step of getting agreement to get us started. And so what I'd like you to do is to read through this situation and then the four response alternatives um, and either make a mental note uh, or jot down on a sheet of paper uh, which one of the four response alternatives you think would be the best uh, response to this particular situation. Because when we actually launch the poll, uh, due to technology limitations, we're not going to be able to provide you with the entire response alternative. So what you will see on the poll will be the four letters, A, B, C, D, and then you will see only a few words following each of the four letters. So take a minute now and look through here, uh, make your choices, and then when Sarah launches the poll, um, you have already made a mental note or written down which response alternative is the one that you think is best. Okay, so there's the poll. Okay, we'll let it go for another couple of seconds and then we'll uh, report the results. Okay, so here are the, um, the results that, um, from your voting. And so you can see 10% of you chose uh, option A, 25% uh, of you, or I'm sorry, 21% chose uh, option B. 18% uh, chose option C, and 51% chose uh, option D. Um, the correct answer uh, is D. Specify the nature of the issue, remind the employee of your expectations, and then question her to see if she agrees that this is an issue. Uh, and the, um, the, the other responses are typical responses that lots of managers uh, might use. Uh, but they uh, are not going to get you where you want to go if you're, real, if you're trying to get the employee to really agree that this is an issue 
that needs to be addressed or improved. And so what we're going to do now is we'll talk about that step of getting agreement and address what managers do wrong, typically, and how you can effectively execute the step uh, to make sure that you've gotten um, agreement that there's, you know, that you're both on the same page. You both see that the uh, that this is an issue that needs correction uh, or improvement. Oops. Hold it. There, uh, sorry about this. There we go. So let me talk a little bit about getting agreement. Uh, what we're doing at this step is we're ensuring. Uh, that the employee recognizes and agrees uh, that there's a performance issue exists. And the reason this step is so critical is that um, typically when we're doing a coaching discussion, uh, we're dealing with a situation that involves a pattern of behavior. That's why I remember when we asked, when we talked about performance, consult, uh, performance coaching earlier, we said, you know, one of the prerequisite uh, prerequisites was that you had given the uh, given the employee feedback at least once about his or her uh, performance. And so, assuming you've given the employee feedback at least once, or maybe twice, or three times, or four times, or five times, or whatever the number is, uh, we're really focusing in on a pattern of behavior. And so, that's important to understand uh, in terms of. Uh, this step of getting agreement is to recognize that that's what the issue that you're dealing with. Uh, and the things that um, managers most often do wrong uh, in this step of getting agreement is the, the primary um, fault that managers have is they assume that the employee sees this situation the same way they do. Um, and particularly when it's a pattern of behavior, you can be virtually certain um, that the employee doesn't see it the same way you do, because if they did, they probably would be taking some steps to try to improve it or change it. And so that's the worst mistake or one of the, one of the four worst mistakes that managers can make uh, in terms of getting agreement is they simply assume that the employee sees it the same way they do. Uh, second reason uh, that managers go wrong with this step is they avoid it altogether. That's, uh, you know, to get a, to, they feel like it's you know it's being too pushy that they they don't want to you know they don't want to press that hard, um, and so they avoid getting in, involved in this kind of discussion altogether. They just never engage in a discussion around getting agreement and making sure that the employee sees the situation uh, the same way that they do. And the third reason that managers fail in this step is that they generalize. So when they, if they do engage in the employee in a discussion around you know, the, the employee's past behavior or performance and what the expectations are. They do that in a general way. Um, you know, that you, you know, you, you, they'll, they'll talk in terms of generalities and not specifics. So if it's the issues around um, you know, uh, attending meetings on time, they'll say something around, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta start attending meetings on time and you haven't been doing that. So they generalize around it instead of being specific about it. Um, and the fourth reason that, that managers fail um, to get agreement is that they, they, they uh, emphasize or try to get agreement around the, the wrong thing. So they have the right string but the wrong yo-yo. So the idea is they're trying to get agreement. So they have the right idea in mind, but they try to get agreement around the fact that for example, if, it was, if it's showing up uh, to meetings late, they try to get agreement around the fact that the employee has showed up to, um, you know, let's say that they've showed up to, they've had, you know, five meetings over the last three weeks and the employee has shown up late to four of them. And so they try to get agreement around the fact that the employee has shown up late for four meetings as opposed to trying to get agreement around the fact that showing up late to meetings is, is not meeting expectations. So they focus in on the wrong thing. And, and they don't focus in on the bigger picture, which is the fact that the employee isn't meeting expectations. So some ways on how to get agreement, um, and so that we can make sure that we end up at the end of this coaching discussion with an employee who is 100% committed to changing his or her behavior or performance, is we need to do two things in the step of getting agreement. One is 
paint a clear mental picture for the employee that there's a difference between what the employee is doing and what's expected. So we need to paint that clear mental picture that there's a difference between what the employee is doing and what's expected. And then the second thing that we will need to do, particularly if we're dealing with a pattern of behavior, is to engage the employee in a discussion of the negative consequences associated with his or her behavior or performance. Because more than likely, if it's a pattern of behavior, the employee sees more positive reasons to continue doing what he or she is doing than negative consequences associated with that behavior or performance. And we need to help the employee to see that, you know, that, that there's a difference here, that there are really more negative consequences for continuing the behavior than there are positive reasons uh, to keep doing it. So let's take each one of these and we'll spend just a second talking about each one of them. So painting a clear mental picture is, again, going back to being specific and not general. So we don't want to say, you know, you've been showing up to meetings late. What we really need to do is to paint this clear picture that here's what you've been doing. You know, over the course of the last three weeks, we've had five, you know, meetings. We've scheduled and had five meetings. And in four out of the five meetings, you've shown up at least 10 minutes late you know, to each to four out of the five meetings. And you know, because we've talked about this previously, that my expectations in this area are that you will be here on time for each of our meetings. So we're trying to paint this clear mental picture for the employee that there's a difference between what they are currently doing and what the expectations are. So without that, uh, they see their performance as or behavior as um, either, you know, as either not a problem or similar to others. And that's the last point on the slide here is that one of the things that you may need to add into this discussion and painting this clear picture is that, uh, is that, that this employee's performance is different from not only what's expected, but different from what other, em other employees are doing um, in terms of showing up on time for meetings. So, because we all know that, you know, some of these things just happen and when you schedule a meeting, somebody's busy and, you know, they can't get there right on time. And so occasionally, you know, everyone probably shows up meet, uh, late to a meeting once in a while. But what we're trying to point out in this particular case with this employee is that, that the, um, not only is the employee's behavior different from what's expected, but the employee's behavior is different from how other people are, are performing. And we're not singling other people out and saying, well, you know, Sally's only been late three times and you've been late four. But we're just talking generally because we're, we recognize that, you know, everyone shows up to, to late to meetings once in a while. But the reason we're talking about this is because you've done it, you know, four out of the last five times. That's the reason we're talking about this. And nobody else has shown up late any more than once. So that's part of painting the clear mental picture, is to make it clear to people that there is this difference between what they're doing and what's expected. And here's an example of how you might uh, paint the clear mental picture. Um, so I'm, I've gotten the information in here about past two months, four reports have been late and one to three days late. Thought I made it clear, previous feedback, that you know, you expect to receive the reports on time. And then asking the question, so do you see this um, as becoming a problem, or do you see this as a problem? So we need to ask that question when we're trying to get agreement. So we don't want to avoid it, uh, and we don't want to generalize about it. We really do want to ask, do you see this uh, as something that needs to be resolved? And uh, my analogy for this step, and if you uh, attended that um, earlier webinar that I did on just getting agreement, um, it's like uh, my analogy here is it's like, you know, when someone attends a, an AA meeting and we're, we have people stand up and we say, you know, my name is Ken and I'm an alcoholic. Um, that's basically what we want employees to do at this point with agreement is we want them to, you know, stand up and say, yeah, okay, I can understand how this is something that needs to be changed, corrected, or improved. So we want to hear those words, um, you know, come out of their mouth. Uh, the second thing, uh, part about this, because it's a pattern of behavior, would be recognizing um, negative consequences. 
And so if you imagine the employee's performance issue as a balance scale uh, where it's weighing on the side of the uh, of positive consequences. In other words, so they see more positive reasons for continuing to do what they're doing than they see negative consequences associated with the act. And because people generally don't do things that they don't perceive to be in their own best interest, if we're dealing with a pattern of behavior, you can be pretty certain that this is probably what's happening, is that the employee sees more positive reasons to um, you know, to continue doing what they're doing, then they see negative consequences associated with the act. For example, if we're turning in late reports, which was the, uh, the example that we had there earlier with the manager uh, talking about um, the uh, uh, painting the clear metal picture, you know, there are some positive consequences for turning reports in late, like I get to spend more time on them to make them better. I need to make sure that they are more complete, et cetera, et cetera. So there may be all kinds of positive reasons that the employee has in his or her mind around, you know, the, around returning in reports late. So what we need to do in this discussion is to help um, employees tilt the scale. So what we need to do is help the employee see that there are more negative than positive consequences associated with this behavior. And, but tilting the scale is not simply a matter of identifying more negative than positive consequences. So when we in, are engaging the, the employee in this discussion around consequences, in particular what we're trying to focus on are consequences that are going to be more certain as well as consequences that are going to be more immediate. Because if we can find and identify consequences that are certain to happen and also are going to be immediate, in other words, they're going to happen in the near future, those are much more likely to tilt the scale faster than just talking about something, for example, like, um, you know, if you keep turning in reports late, uh, what it's going to do is it's probably going to affect the way I'm going to, you know, evaluate you on your, uh, you know, performance uh, appraisal evaluation. and. You know, if the performance appraisal evaluation is, you know, a number of months down the road, it's it's not very immediate, and also, um, you know, if the there's also a strong likelihood that, you know, that the that you as the manager may forget about all of this if I, you know, in, in when it comes to performance appraisal time, so it's even less certain to happen. So that's why we want to focus on consequences that are more certain and more immediate to tilt the scale. Okay, so let's go on to the next poll and we'll go on to the next step of um, exploring alternatives. So same thing here, take a minute to read through the situation and the response alternatives. Make a mental note of the uh, response alternative that you think is best or jot it down and then we'll launch the poll and um, see what you come up with. Okay, we'll let you uh, vote here for a couple more minutes, or a couple more seconds, I'm sorry. Okay. So Sarah's launched the poll, and you can see that 7% uh, of you chose uh, response alternative A, 15% B, 28% C and 49% D. And uh, with this particular item, uh, the correct response is uh, D. So recognize the employee's ID, ID, I, idea. Then question the employee to see if he can think of any other suggestions for overcoming the performance problem in addition to the one already mentioned. So let's focus on exploring alternatives and we'll see why that is the correct um, response or the best response in this particular case.
So during the step of exploring alternatives, uh, to ensure, again, that we end up at the end of that performance coaching meeting uh, with 100% commitment uh, that the employee is going to go forward and, you know, correct the situation, um, it's critical uh, that an employee feels a sense of ownership of the solution. And what happens in most cases is uh, managers are their um, worst enemy uh, when it comes to uh, executing this particular step. And what typically happens is when, is how managers go wrong is number one, uh, they are quick to jump in and furnish solutions without first, being, first asking the employee for his or her ID, ideas. And I think this happens naturally for most managers. Uh, and it happens naturally because most of the time managers know you know, workable solutions. I mean, they've been around the block before. They probably dealt with other employees, you know, who had a similar kind of issue. They know what's worked with other people, or they've talked with other, you know, managers or supervisors who've had employees with similar situations. And so more than likely, they've got some good workable solutions. And so that's one of the reasons they're quick to jump in and start furnishing solutions without first asking the employee for his or her um, ideas. And the second reason is that I think a lot of managers feel like they want to be helpful. So what they do is they think they're being helpful by getting in and offering solutions to the employee uh, to correct this particular performance issue or um, this behavior that we're trying to get uh, corrected or improved. And the second main reason that managers go wrong during this step is they fail to keep the discussion a dialogue. So while they may get one example of a solution from uh, from the uh, one solution from the employee, uh, they they again revert back into their uh, you know safety zone where they are dealing with the solutions that they know that work. Um, and again, they think they're being helpful, so they fall back into the trap of doing most of the talking as opposed to you know keeping the employee engaged. Uh, in identifying alternatives and talking about those. Uh, and so again, when we get to the end of the meeting, there's just a lot less like the employee is a lot less likely to be 100% committed to implementing you know, any of these solutions. So the way that managers should uh, explore alternatives is the manager should begin by asking the employee to identify solutions. So after you've gotten agreement, from the employee that yes, okay, I agree that this is a situation that needs to be improved or needs to be corrected. I understand now, you know, completely why that's the case. Then what we want to do is instead of jumping in and offering solutions, we want to begin by asking the employee to identify solutions. So we say, okay, now that we've got an agreement, let's talk about this some more. What do you think you might do differently here? Uh, what ideas have you come up with to you know kind of to resolve this situation or to improve to solve this problem? And then what we want to do is if the employee comes up with a solution, uh, we want to acknowledge that suggestion. And I've used the word acknowledge here carefully because if you don't think it's a good idea, you don't have to say it is, but at least acknowledge it and say something like, you know, that's one possibility, that's certainly, a, that's certainly a, you know, an option, um, that's one alternative. So we're at least acknowledging, acknowledging the suggestion. Now, if you think it's a good idea, it's okay to say that, you know, that's, that's a great idea. And then steps three and four here, depending on how you want to do this, and it's really up to personal preference, is you can then take that idea and talk about the benefits and drawbacks of that particular solution. And then once you've done that, then ask for additional ideas. Or the other option is if you want to follow the true tenets of brainstorming, is to go uh, acknowledge the idea ask for additional ideas, acknowledge any additional ideas, ask for an additional idea. So you go back and forth between uh, step two and step four until you get all the ideas out, then go back and take each one of them and say, okay, well, so let's go back to the first idea you mentioned, and that was this, and let's talk about that. How do you think that's going to help? Do you see any downside to it? And as we're engaging in this discussion, what we want to do as the manager is also contribute to the discussion of the benefits 
and the drawbacks of each of these alternatives as we talk about them. So here's your chance as the manager to share your experience, to share your thoughts, um, and to talk about you know, your perceptions of the various solutions that have been put out on the table. And after you've gotten all the employees' suggestions out and you've talked about them, if there are some additional ideas that you would like the employee to consider, now is the time to offer them, but not beforehand. Because the problem is that if you start offering your solutions too soon, um, particularly if you do it early on, the impression you send to the employee is, well, here's what you want me to do. And again, because it's your idea and not the employee's idea, you're likely to end up at the end of the performance coaching discussion uh, with less than 100 percent um, commitment on the part of the employee to change or improve um, his or her behavior or, or performance. So uh, you want to keep your, keep your ideas or solutions in your hip pocket. Bring those out um, after the employee's gotten out all his or her ideas and you've talked about them. Then you can put yours out there, talk about what you see as the benefits and drawbacks of, of your ideas. Um, and uh, so you've got them now all on the table. And so remember, and this is a key point here, is the goal of this step of exploring alternatives is to maximize the number of solutions that are available for the employee to choose from. It's not to make a choice. So we're, and that's another problem that, uh, that uh, another way that managers go wrong is they will merge this step with the next step that we're going to talk about here in a moment um, about getting a commitment to act. So we, we're not trying to make a choice here. We're just simply trying to get on the table what the solutions are and to talk about them, what their relative benefits and drawbacks are. Okay, so let's go on to our last poll and the last step of getting a commitment to act. So again, go through here, read the situation. Take a look at um, and jot down, make a mental note or jot down on a piece of paper what you you think the best response alternative is. Okay, so Okay, so we can now view the poll. So you can see 23% uh, of you uh, chose um, A, and 2% chose B, so that wasn't a very popular choice. 4% uh, chose C, um, and 70% chose D. Um, and the correct, uh, the correct response is um, A. And if you notice, A and D are very similar. The only difference between the two is uh, that you are acknowledging the fact that um, in A, you're acknowledging the fact that uh, you think the you know you've identified some good approaches. So you're acknowledging the fact that we you know we went through that uh, exploring alternatives step. We came up with some good ideas, talked about them, and we're now going to make a choice. So that's why A is a as a better response than D because it doesn't contain the acknowledgement of the discussion of the previous step. Here we go. 
So focusing on the step of getting a commitment to act, uh, again, so to ensure that we're going to have 100% commitment from the employee when we finish the um, coaching discussion and the employee is 100% committed to going out and making the changes or improve, improvements needed, um, it's critical that the employee is allowed to choose the solution or solutions uh, he or she thinks will work best. So. Uh, it's important not to make the choice for the employee and unfortunately uh, most managers are their own worst enemy uh, when executing this step uh, because they do one of these three things. Either they skip the step altogether because they assume just because we've talked about a number of alternatives that somehow the employee is either going to run off and do all of them or the employee is, you know, has figured out because we did talk about you know, there some of their uh, pluses and minuses or advantages, disadvantages. So the employee's got all that stuff figured out and is, is going to pick the best one and go do it. So we don't even ask, you know, what are you going to do and when are you going to do it? Or they will make the choice for the employee. They'll say, okay, we've talked about all these steps and, you know, here's the one I think you ought to do, and it's this one. Um, <clears throat> and they so they make the choice uh, for the employee because they have typically will do that because they have a predisposition towards what the best solution is. Um, and so one of the things that's important for managers to understand here um, when, they're, when they're talking um, about solutions with an employee is to understand the difference between alternatives that aren't preferable and alternatives that aren't feasible. Because anything that's not preferable uh, is simply showing the bias of the manager. In other words, the manager has a bias you know, against a particular uh, alternative. That doesn't mean that it's not good, and it doesn't mean that it won't work for the employee uh, just because the manager doesn't prefer it. Uh, but if, in fact, there are d uh, alternatives that were discussed or thrown out on the table that aren't feasible, uh, it is the manager's responsibility to remove those from the discussion um, at the previous step of exploring alternatives. So if the employee suggests something uh, during that previous discussion of exploring alternatives that isn't feasible, it simply can't be done, um, then it's important to remove it from the discussion there. So you don't want to leave that on the table. So when you get down to the step of getting a commitment to act, to act and you're asking the employee to make a choice, you don't want them to choose uh, the solution that's not feasible and then have to tell them, au contraire, you can't do that one because, and then explain it to them at that point. So take it off the table uh, when it comes up during the discussion of, of exploring alternatives. But recognize that there's a difference between solutions that aren't uh, preferable from those that aren't uh, feasible. And the third reason that managers go wrong on this step <clears throat> is if they do ask the employee for what the employee is going to do, they will rarely ask the second question, which is, when are you going to do it? <clears throat> so we want to ask for both the what the employee is going to do and the when the employee is going to start doing it. It increases the level of commitment if we're asking the employee to not only choose an alternative, but then to explain or tell when the employee is going to you know, start implementing the particular alternative. So the, the way to get a commitment to act um, is to, as a manager, should begin by asking the employee to choose one of the solutions. So it's, you would do as we find that example for the poll. Acknowledge the fact that it's, you know the fact that we've identified four different alternatives here. I think we've come up with some good choices, some good alternatives. And so uh, what I'd like to do is to begin by then asking you, which one of the four do you think would work best for you? And then once the employee has made a, made a choice, we want to support the employee's choice, which is the second step of this, uh, the second part of this step. And then the third thing we want to do is ask the employee, okay, so you've chosen this, now when do you think you can start doing this? And then there's nothing wrong with, uh, particularly if the employee chose uh, an alternative that uh, perhaps um, 
wasn't your most preferred alternative, that you know that there were some others that you're another one that you preferred more than the one the employee chose. There's nothing wrong with following up with that part four and ask the employee, okay, so in addition to this option that you've chosen or alternative that you've chosen, do you think there's anything else you need to do to correct this situation or change your behavior in this area? And if the employee makes another selection, uh, makes another choice and says something like, well, I probably also should do X, then we want to support the choice, and then which is part two, and then ask the employee when he or she can implement that solution. So we just use this as a process, just as we did the exploring alternatives, to get, uh, employee to, uh, get the employee to commit to take some kind of action um, after, the, after the performance coaching meeting is over. So that, uh, those are the three steps from this seven-step coaching process that uh, are, in my mind and through my experience, the most critical ones in terms of making sure that, it, that when employees leave a performance coaching discussion that you know that um, more than likely they're 100 percent committed to making changes or improvement. And, uh, th and again, there are steps that, uh, as we pointed out, that most managers don't get right. They, they, um, you know, they're, the one, they're the ones that they get wrong the most often, and it ends up shooting them in the, themselves in the foot because they do that. So a quick summary. Uh, these are the three most critical steps to ensure employee commitment. Uh, you want to get agreement, explore alternatives, get a commitment to act, and then follow the processes that we talked about with each one of these. So getting agreement, paint a clear mental picture that there's a difference between what the employee is doing, what's expected, and then talk about the negative consequences associated with the employee's behavior or performance, particularly if we're talking about patterns of behavior. Exploring alternatives, we want to make sure that we hold our suggestions as a manager, hold ours in abeyance, get the employee to talk about things first, get the employee's ideas out there, talk about them, then it's okay to share yours, but don't jump in with yours too soon. And then lastly, in terms of getting a commitment to act, is we want to make sure that we don't make the choice for the employee, but we let the employee choose, understand the difference between alternatives that aren't preferable, uh, alternatives that aren't feasible, and then um, in terms of uh, also asking not only what the employee is going to do, uh, but when the employee is going to do them. And if we execute those steps flawlessly, um, then we will be able to ensure that we're going to have commitment and not compliance. So with that, we can move to uh, questions. Sarah, we've got just a few minutes left here. Great. Keep sending in your questions. I already have a handful here, Ken. Um, so if I can uh, keep up with them, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to um, go ahead and see if we can start tackling some of these now. Um, to um, start with one that, that sort of came in a little early, um, it's from Bonnie. And Bonnie is asking, um, so you already have the employee who, who agrees that there's that there's an issue or a gap or a performance problem. Um, but, but during that conversation, um, they're just not able to get the employee to offer suggestions for improvement. Are there any kind of phrases or um, lead-ins or questioning techniques that you could suggest so that that dialogue really, even if the employee um, or the manager has the best intentions of not making it a monologue, you know, that it does become a, a discussion and they, they are getting that employee to participate. Yeah, great question, Sarah. Great question. Or great question, Bonnie. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, there are a couple of ideas um, and recommendations that I would have. One is, uh, depending on how urgent it is to get the situation solved right at the, the moment you're in this meeting, one alternative might be to say, well, okay, if you can't think of anything, why don't we, why don't we table the meeting for a while? You know, let's take, you know, take the rest of the day, we'll pick it back up tomorrow, or why don't you take the rest of the morning and we'll pick it, up back, uh, pick it back up this afternoon, and think about it and see if you can't come up with some ideas, particularly if you think the employee probably could and for some reason or another they just seem to be stonewalling and they're just not offering anything. 
and so you can give them some additional time. Now, what you want to do is be specific about that, that you're going to reconvene this meeting and when it's going to be so that the employee doesn't get the impression that you know, you're, you're letting him or her off the hook. And then the other part of that is you need to reconvene the meeting when you say you're going to do it. Otherwise, they will have figured out, well, here's a way to get out of ever resolving any of these things. I'll just tell you that I can't think of anything. And you'll give me more time to think about it, and we'll never go back and discuss it. So, so that's one of the things. Give the person more time. If you don't need to solve it immediately, right during that meeting, then it may be, especially if you think that the employee could come up with some ideas, give them some more time to, to think about it. The other thing, the other approach would be to prime the pump. Now, as a manager, you need to be careful with this so that you all of a sudden aren't being the, the, uh, you know, the person coming up with all the solutions. But you could offer one idea. You could say, well, you know, one idea that occurs to me that you might try is this. Let it put it out on the table. Then go back to your question. What other ideas can you think of? And so you use it to, to prime the pump and see if that doesn't get the conversation started or get the conversation moving. So those are two suggestions that I would have for dealing with that, that particular situation, Sarah. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark. Mark asks, um, do you have to discuss the negative consequences? So if the employee already agrees, do you even have to kind of go into those negative consequences in that discussion? Good question, Mark. Um, the answer is um, a qualified no. Uh, and let, let me just um, you know, let me share a real life story with you that um, will point this out. Um, this was a number of years ago, so because he's considerably older now, but I have an adult uh, son who, and this occurred when he had graduated from high school and he was uh, going to uh, college at the University of Minnesota. And he did exceedingly well socially his first year, uh, his freshman year at the University of Minnesota. And so he came back at the end of the first term uh, and the end of the first year, um, and he was barely allowed to go back for his sophomore year. So he had a great, he did very well socially. So after he got back, we had, and we got the grades, we had a little discussion and I said, well, his name is Kerry, and I said, Kerry, you know, here, here's, your, here's your painting a clear mental picture, here's your grade point average, you know, here's what's going to happen if you get any, if you get any D's at all next year as a sophomore, what's going to happen is you're going to be thrown out of school, um, and then you're going to have to come back home um, and so I painted the clear mental picture for them, for him, and and I said, so do you agree that you've got to you know you got to get this thing corrected and you got to start getting better grades? And what do you think he said? Sure, Dad, I understand completely. You you would expect that, right? But I didn't want to let that go because I thought this was so important that I'm going to push it a little bit further. So what I did is I engaged him in a discussion of negative consequences and said, okay, great, I'm glad you think you're going to get things back on track, but let's talk about it a little bit more. What do you think is going to happen if, you know, you get tossed out of school? What do you think is going to happen? What, what do you think will happen? Well, I'll probably have to come home, you know, and live at home. I said, yeah, that's probably true. And what else do you think is going to happen? Well, another thing is, he said, well, I'll probably have to get a job. I said, yeah, right, you will have to get a job. And what else do you think is going to happen? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, another thing is if you get a job, you're going to end up paying rent. Um, and so anyway, my point was that what I did is I made the decision to push that a little bit harder just because I wanted to make a point. So I think that's the, uh, that's the beauty of the negative consequences. You, you, you can use them if you need them. And even if you've got an agreement with painting the clear metal picture, you can still use them to you know, emphasize the point further if you think it needs it. Great. And how did he end up doing? Oh, he did um, very well. He, <laughs> he he turned it around and uh, and he graduated. And um, so yes, we never had any more problems after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Good. Good. Um, we have um, a, um, a similar question um, from. Leanne, she um, talks about how um, good this strategy seems to be in responding to performance issues and concerns. Um, but she's interested in um, potentially using this to coach proactively to address potentially anticipated performance gaps. 
um, with her staff. Um, so there may not necessarily be an exact incident that's been triggered, but um, you know something proactive that she'd be looking to do. Would this kind of model apply for that type of usage? Um, sure, I, I think it would. I think it works. Um, I, I think it works not only for dealing with performance problems or behavior issues, but even with uh, if you're dealing with uh, uh, in a situation, for example, where someone might be, you know, doing okay, but because you know that person, you know they could do a lot better. And the only difference is how much emphasis you put on that whole step of getting agreement and how hard you decide you want to push on that. But I, or you can use it. Um, in the case of the question, could you use it with a group? Sure. You know, if you've got your team of people, again, it's, you know, how hard do you want to push it? But you can certainly talk about that. You know, here's what's happening, and what do you think, you know, the consequences of that are, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you can, you can do all of that, but what you do is you just, yeah, change the, uh, uh, and just adjust the amount of, um, you know, kind of intensity that you, that you put on those, on that step of getting agreement. Great. And um, I think we'll have time probably here for one more question. Um, Kim, this one kind of comes from the other direction. This one is from Jesus. And they ask, as an employee, so on the employee side, how do you open up a discussion to a manager who is not seeking feedback? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> I think that probably, well, probably because of the boss-employee relationship that one of the first questions that I would ask would be, um, you know, and I think it's perfectly okay and, and uh, to be upfront about this and, and ask whether or not the, the, you know, the manager or the supervisor or, uh, you know, is, is open to receiving any feedback and, you know, and get, uh, and then they may ask, well, why are you asking the question? But then engage in a discussion around, you know, why you'd like to give the feedback and, you know, just think it would be helpful in terms of, you know, clarifying whatever it is, clarifying the relationship you have or clarifying what's expected. So I, I, I think that that's a perfectly appropriate approach to use. You just have to be a little more tentative about how you put it out there. And that's why I would ask for permission first. Great. Thank you so much, and keep sending in your questions to us. Um, I can already see, Ken, that there is a pattern here to the questions. Um, we have some additional questions here around opening the meeting, closing the meeting, and in particular, handling excuses. So I do have a feeling that we will run a um, third webinar with you um, so that you can really get into those actionable items um, around that seven-step coaching process um, and give people a lot more, a lot more detail there. So um, if you're on the line today with us, take a look. Um, you'll be seeing an announcement on that. We'll cover the other, um, the other steps that we haven't quite gotten to yet. And I do um, want to introduce the coaching skills inventory. Um, that's really been the foundation of our presentation today. You will use this assessment in your organization to achieve the results you're looking for. And you can review the facilitator set. It's a 30-day risk-free. It's only $25 since you're on the line with us today. So that's a huge savings, regularly priced at $115. You do get in the set the trainer instructions, the PowerPoint presentation um, that goes with the classroom session, which is a little bit different than what um, Ken reviewed today as far as the PowerPoint. Um, a preview of the assessment. And then there's also developmental background information as well. Don't forget to use the coupon code. Um, it's COACH3WEBINAR, um, and that's good until December 31st, so make sure that you don't miss out. We really appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative. Thank you, everybody, and have a happy holiday.